Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. This is an event as part of our 2020 virtual series on inclusive uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And we're delighted for the first time today to have one of our first generation to college students lead this panel, who also happens to be a student at CU Boulder and also happens to be an entrepreneur. So uh, we're delighted that you've joined us for this. We will be recording this session and it will be on the Global Minded 2020 YouTube channel. It'll be posted tomorrow so you can share it uh, with your friends. And I wanna say that uh, Praful Shah is going to be um, introducing uh, our panel leader today. And Praful and I met a few years ago because he is very humble, so he won't say this, but I will. He has invested in a lot of companies that are led by women and people of color. And one of those companies is uh, called, um, uh, it's Jessica Matthews company. I don't know if it's still called Un Unchartered Play, but she was one of our speakers a few years ago and he came to Global Minded Conference to see her and that's where we met. And ever since then, he has been a very strong part of our leadership. So Praful is um, also on the Global Minded uh, Foundations and Funders equity team but he has a whole other hat as an investor. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Praful Shah. Oh, thank you, Carol. It's my pleasure to introduce Monica Groves from XPRIZE, Juan Zavala from New Market Venture, and my good friend Murdoch, Kalegi from Wellness. And as Carol mentioned, David Lopez, uh, is the moderator for today's panel. David, take it away. Thank you, Prafu, and thank you, Carol, for the opportunity. I hope everybody on this webinar is, is, is excited as I am today to learn about, you know, how to get minorities funded and what that process looks like, um, and because I'm going through it right now. And so a little bit about myself. I'm a first-generation, low-income college student. As Carol said, I'm a student at the University of Colorado Boulder, where I study business, um, and I'm currently uh, in my senior year. Um, but outside of school and outside of CU, I am an entrepreneur, um, where I, I built Internalize, and our team and I have been working on it for just over three years now, where we have had good days and we've had bad days and you know we've been right plenty of times we've also been wrong more times and which has led to our, our most recent pivot to transform and internalize into what it is today which is a 12-week sales and emotional intelligence boot camp aimed at launching underrepresented students into roles in in sales and high demand industries while placing them at our partner companies and so currently we're internalized is that right now is we've in our first, we've launched our first cohort with five students. We have already had one of our students be hired and uh, another one is in the interview process where, you know, now we have some revenue in the door. Now we have a little bit of traction. Now what, right? That, that's kind of where, where I'm at. And so I'm very, very excited for our, our panelists today. And I'm very fortunate to, you know, really tap into, you know, some of the experts in, in this space. And so um, without further ado, we can have uh, Monica, if you want to give us a quick overview of, you know, who you are and your background, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much, David. Um, my name is Monica Groves. Um, I am manager of prize operations at XPRIZE. And XPRIZE is known as a nonprofit that incentivizes solutions to the world's grandest challenges. Um, I lead activations in multi-generational education, learner empowerment, and also intersectionality in ed tech. Um, been with the company for about four years and I'm really excited because I work on our XPRIZE Connect initiative for education for youth, as well as our XPRIZE Rapid Reskilling Prize, which is about reskilling people from line workers, those affected by COVID-19, into living wage, fast-growing jobs. So really excited to be here to talk to you more about how the you know, first gen can really be beneficial to the overall, you know, zeitgeist of VCs and funding as we go into this new future of ours, socially distanced. Thank you, Monica. Definitely excited to, to you know, learn more about your, your expertise in the field. Um, Murdoch, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Great to be here with Carol and my brother, Praful Shah. Um, I am a physician uh, originally by training, and I years ago started uh, getting involved in launching health technology companies. And since then, I've um, helped launch over a half dozen, all of which have done all right, and nearly all of which are, are women-led or from underrepresented groups. Great to be here. Thank you, Murdoch. 
Uh, and, and Juan, would you like to wrap this up? Sure, happy to be here. Um, so I'm Juan Zavala. I work at a firm called New Markets Venture Partners. We're focused on investing uh, in education and workforce companies uh, that improve economic mobility prospects for underserved populations, so low income, first generation. Um, and we're you know very focused on very efficacious solutions, things that kind of take people um, th through certain milestones in the education to employment journey, um, things that where people generally drop off, especially minority populations, um, you know, in third grade literacy, sixth grade math, high school graduation, uh, persistence in college, those, those kinds of things. We, we invest in companies that uh, improve those outcomes for that population. And in our portfolio, um, we're also focused on underversing the portfolio level. We invested in 32% of our companies are either women or minority um, founded or led. Awesome, thank you so much, Juan. Um, so let's just go ahead and, and get right into it. Um, Monica, I'm going to, I'm going to start with you because I, I'm currently in college, I'm wrapping up um, and all things entrepreneurship and, you know, getting ready on campus has always been around uh, the campus wide business plan competition. And so, you know, as a college student, I'm, I feel prepared to, you know, go on, go on a stage and I have my five minute slide deck, um, you know, along with the presentation. Now, you know, say, say we're able to, to get some, some funds from that. Um, how can we use, you know, different con contests as well as competitions um, and those presentations that come with it, um, you know, with, to, to really push the company forward? Yeah, definitely. Um, there's, uh, your business plan in that competition is a really great place to start. It's a good foundation. And you can use those pitch decks and all of the documents, your business plan, things to really put you into the next level. And those can be leveraged to win funds in incentivized competitions. Um, there's other organizations who do it outside of XPRIZE, but at XPRIZE, we're really um, looking for people who have ideas. Ideas can come from anyone, anywhere. And the great thing about it is there's prize money if you are able to compete and successfully you know, move through the competition. And one thing about it is that, you know, from suborbital space flight to, like I said, the Rapid Resealing X Prize, we're really looking to be able to find people who are thinking outside the box when it comes to education, AI, robotics, the future of work, even the pandemic and how we can tackle the need for PPE as well as vaccines um, to be able to bring their best ideas to the table to win money. And the great thing about it, there's a low barrier of entry. Um, usually our competition registration fees are thousand dollars or less. In some cases they're free, which is the case for a lot of our human centered prizes such as X Prize Rapid Reskilling. Um, and also you get exclusive access and a little bit of some coaching from the X Prize ecosystem mentorship, one-of-a-kind opportunities as well as connections, and to really be positioned in your industry as an expert. And you're able to work on your um, business, your product, your service, all while competing and being able to win money during the milestones. So even if you sign up and you're competing, you can win money as a milestone winner, a semi-finalist, a finalist, and a grand prize winner. So even if you don't make it to be a grand prize winner, there's still opportunity for you to be able to win monies that you can put back into improving your service, your products, your offerings during the life of the competition. And then you get to meet more people that can really help you outside of the competition, really take your business or your idea or your service to the next level. So even though we think traditionally about VCs, angel donors, and fears and family being able to help you financially boost and get your business off the ground, there's also other resources and other alternatives that you can do in conjunction, which is incentivized competitions that allow you to be able to win monies while you put the money you win back into that product or service or offering to be able to get you where you want to go. And it also extends you beyond the usual industry specific ecosystem or network you may have and puts you in an arena with like a global leaders, gatekeepers, entrepreneurs to really be able to look at how you can do something maybe US based, but also how you scale and find kind counterparts in other parts of the world to be able to do the work because we're always looking about being future forward, but also about disrupting industries and being able to scale beyond the first iteration. And just as a, a quick follow up, you know, among all of the, all of the benefits that you just mentioned, um, would you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, would you say that most, uh, you know, competitions that come with prize money, uh, you know, like you said, to pump back into your company, come, do a lot of these competitions take equity or is it just prize money? Um, and if so, if they don't take equity, you know, I, I, I would agree that that was a, a big step in maybe not going after the venture capital route. 
Yeah, um, it, we do not take equity when someone comes into an X prize competition. Whatever comp, um, service, product, idea they have is proprietary. It's owned by you. We are just a facilitator. That's a great thing because you don't have to sell a part of or give a percentage of your business in order to compete and win monies. We're all about social change and really disrupting how we tackle some challenges that are local, global, that can be specific to, you know, global warming. It can be specific to education, work the pandemic. So I think it's very important and something that makes us very unique because we don't take ownership in any way of the technology that you develop while you're in the competition. And you can actually have services and options outside of the competition that do different things. So I think that's great because we don't pigeonhole you. You have freedom to develop something for the competition specifically, but also because it's your business and you own it, you can do things outside of the competition that can be very similar with different offerings. So I think that's a very important thing to note is that when you're in a competition at XPRIZE, we don't take ownership of any of your technology or anything you develop during the competition. We're here to facilitate and get you to the next level. And that's that um, center and that North Star and the core of being of service and service to you know humankind to be able to really put us forward in the future. And yeah, thank you so much. That mm -hmm. that you know, I, I definitely feel a lot more complete um, in, in that realm of, of the process. Um, and you know, maybe this one I'll direct to Murdoch, but then would love everyone's input. Um, is, is around how can we use our background um, as a minority or, you know, as a person of color, um, you know, coming from low income or first generation, how can we use our background to our advantage? Um, and maybe, you know, what skills uh, from overcoming adversity will translate into entrepreneurship? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question. So I mentioned that most of the companies that I've helped launch um, have been with with uh, women or underrepresented groups, that was not uh, that was not charitable <laughs> of me. I, I did that because I recognized the people I had worked with, and this is not absolute, but in general, possessed a lot greater skill that's incredibly valuable for an entrepreneur or a CEO. Um, over years, I've no noticed, and this is just pattern recognition, that one of the most um, essential skills of, of a CEO is the ability to um, the ability to put down one's own, own ego, to, to swallow one's own pride and be able to figure out, okay, what, what's the best path forward? It requires a certain humility um, to, to really adjust uh, and, and, and find that optimal path. And in general, um, and there are many exceptions to this, but in general, like the the four female CEOs I've worked with, the the three minority CEOs I worked with, bear those qualities um, more. And I think it's because you, you you have to undergo certain things through your life that give you more of that that skill to be able to have that that humility rather than you know, sort of think you righteously deserve anything. So um, there's that. And then of course, there's just the um, aspect of resilience. That's the other essential skill I, I, I've seen among CEOs, the, the ones who can get the hundred no's because every, every entrepreneur, every CEO, even the best ideas. I mean, I've had amazing companies that have gotten a hundred no's before they've gotten anywhere. And, and it takes a certain ability to be able to keep getting that and keep moving forward. Um, and so the, res uh, the resilience you build throughout your life to be able to overcome whatever circumstances or whatever perception of you or what have you to get to a certain place ends up being really invaluable as, as a, a CEO of a venture. So, so in my opinion, um, you know, uh, if, if coming from that background, while often it can come with certain challenges, it can, it can afford certain, um, additional abilities that are incredibly valuable in the, in the um, entrepreneurial space. Uh, and so I think to answer your question, if you can kind of focus on those skill sets, that, that ability to be resilient, that ability to, to have humility and be willing to adjust and figure out what the, what the right path forward is, um, that can go a long way as a, a venture CEO. And, and yeah, thank you. I definitely, um, have been able to kind of look at my own experiences and, you know, 
the things I grew up, you know, maybe not a, a other students, you know, my age should have ever gone through. But looking back at it, I'm I, now I'm starting to see, you know, the impact. But um, uh, I, I definitely would, you know, any of our other panelists want to, you know, chime in on that one. I'll just add one more comment uh, along with what Murdoch said. Uh, when it gets to Series A or Series B, typically only two percent of the companies that pitch actually get the funding. So should be prepared to talk to at least hundreds of angel investors and VCs before you get the funding. And and yeah, so that, that resiliency key will, will definitely factor in there. Um, so, you know, realistically, how different um, and, you know, maybe difficult is the journey to getting funded for first generation people of color, um, you know, maybe compared to others per se. And, and this is to, to anybody. Very difficult. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult for everybody, but it's extra hurdles for, for women and uh, people of minorities. On other hand, uh, as uh, Carol talked about the, the investment I had with uh, Jessica Matthews, a, a first generation uh, Nigerian woman. Uh, it was tough getting her started, but now she's flying high. So I think it's, it's the initial hurdle. Once, once they get to a point where they are successful, all of a sudden people realize that, hey, this is great, let's, uh, let's help her out. It's tough getting started, but I think eventually the playing field does level out. And just to add on, what we tend to see is that it's, it's a very relationship-based industry, right? And, and coming as a, as a first generation or a person of color, I think in, in, on average, you have less relationships than someone who has inter intergenerational wealth in this country, right? So, you know, as, as everybody has to pitch to hundreds of VCs, but the person who has relationships from their parents or grandparents, they can introduce them to, you know, say 50 people with, uh, with fun, fun funding. Um, but if you might, your parent maybe can't introduce you to anybody, right? And so you have to find those relationships elsewhere. Um, so it's just, uh, it's a big volume game. And, you know, what you always gotta do is once you, once you get, you know, you pitch to somebody, always ask for like the next uh, referral. You know, and, and most people are pretty, you know, safe. If, if they're not, uh, if it's not a fit, they're willing to add value in another way by at least an introduction. And you continue to, you know, follow up till you get the intro. And, and that's how you kind of build out that big network of VCs and other funders. It's just a lot harder because you're starting with, with a lot less relationships built in. Yeah, definitely. I'd love to add on to that. Um, another aspect is for those who are in leadership, at the VCs, those who are angel investors. Um, sometimes, especially right now with the current climate, there needs to be a shift in their emotional intelligence as well as their cultural competency to really see, understand, and know the value of the businesses of first generation um, people of color. I think it's very important. A lot of times those who are in leadership, they did, as Juan said, they had those great introductions from family members and friends, and they had that safety net, and they had, you know, a bit of a head start in the game because they had connections already. And so that tends to breed a little bit of nepotism. So I think it's important, as, you know, our first gen people of color founders, they go out, they pitch, they pitch, they pitch, but there also needs to be some change in leadership and in the way that they look and the way that they ascertain, the way that they take in the information. Because just being humans, we tend to be more comfortable with things that are more like us and people who look like us. So when it comes to someone with a different background, different you know, outlook, they may be a bit more reticent to jump on board and feel that there's more risk to you know, funding this person that they don't fully identify with. And I think that's an important thing and an important thing to bring out is a lot of times, you know, it's a two-way street, you know, our funders also have some responsibility in increasing opportunity for first gen and also people of color entrepreneurs who are out pitching. Yeah, you know, I, I think I, I will add something onto that too. It just having been a, you know, a female starting her own company after doing 17 years in corporate um, that I think not just looking at this, like what does the entrepreneur need to know, 
but what do these investors need to know? And I think that is such a critical part of a reciprocal relationship that for things to really shift, we have to really look at that the fact that a lot of investors are from the more privileged white world of wealth. And so how do all of the different sectors that can interface with that um, be able to work with organizations like Global Minded and others to find the David Lopez's that are out there and to really be there to, to help them in a number of different ways. Um, so I think it, I just see it as working both ways. At the VC funds that have a, a female partner, they are at least twice as likely to invest in a female founder company. So basically what Monica was saying, you just, just the type of, just because you happen to know someone like you, you tend to invest in them. Representation matters. Um, and so my next question is around um, something that I've been putting a lot more effort to in entrepreneurship, um, which is maybe a skill that, you know, I hope to come into play, but how important is the ability to, you know, tell a, tell a compelling story or, you know, talk about your own background when it comes to looking for investment. And, you know, like Juan, you said, building relationships with investors. How, how important is, is, you know, crafting a story that fits me and my background and how I come or, or and how I've come into internalize uh, can really, you know, maybe push my fundraise forward? It's, it's very important, um, especially in the early stages, because at, at the end of the day, a VC is, is uh, you know, you don't have a lot of data to go on. You know, you have kind of a thesis, an idea, but there's no cash flow or finance, like historical financials you can underwrite. So we're, uh, we're evaluating character uh, in, 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 in a lot of the kind of you know, traditional uh, investment sense, like we're, we're looking at grit and ability to, you know, get through downturns and to continue to push forward, ability to, to pivot if necessary, coachability, um, you know, willingness to be coached. So, and, and, and it's a story that you're, you're telling, like you're selling something. Uh, so if it's not engaging from the beginning and you're not able to, you know, show how your background is, is a good fit for what you're pursuing and that your personality and your character is going to grow this company the way you say, um, then then there's, there's, there's little chance of, of investment. So, I mean, the story is extremely important um, more so than, I mean, you gotta know your numbers, you gotta know what you're selling, but engaging an audience um, from the beginning uh, is, is super important. Yeah, thank you. I was seeing if anyone else wanted to tap in on that, but um, you know, there's this notion that people of color, you know, women entrepreneurs uh, are, are maybe over mentored and under invested in. Um, and, and so for someone that's a, a first time founder, um, I've definitely been mentored and that has helped me grow tenfold. I just, I haven't necessarily experienced it, but maybe how, how as an entrepreneur, can you make sure that maybe that doesn't happen or, you know, from the investor side of being, you know, if, if there's that, this notion of like, what do you need to see from a first time founder? Because, you know, Juan, like, again, you mentioned the, the character aspect, um, you know, how much more does a, a first time minority founder need to prove to the investor before they actually get that investment? And is this process, you know, long for, for everybody, you know, there's relationships with investors that are spending a few months now and there's been no conversations. Um, is that normal? And I just got to, you know, of course I'm always going to build, but um, is that notion true or, um, you know, things like that. And, and this is just something that, you know, I, I've, I've kind of stumbled upon uh, while looking uh, at fundraising options. I think it depends on the investors. I personally do not invest in any startup or unlikely to invest in a company startup uh, unless they have a, at least one a uh, woman in a high position or a founder. And, and similarly, lots of investors have certain criteria like that. So what you should do is uh, make sure that whoever you're talking to are willing to accept uh, minorities or women founders as someone they invest in. 
rather than going the other way around trying to convince them that I'm great. I think they'll, they'll, they'll know. And on that point, would you say, you know, maybe establishing these relationships with investors, maybe ask them, you know, okay, Profil, well, you know, say internalize, you know, we need help on that, on that front. Are you willing to mentor us through that? And then of course we're building in the background. And then maybe once we get that, you know, that conversation can, can, you know, come up front. Is, is that something that, you know, as an entrepreneur, I should be direct about, or is that just something, you know, I, I got to take into play because I'm, you know, I'm a first time founder and, you know, I, I trust this in this investor to, you know, lead me in the right direction. You should talk to more than one person. So, you know, I might have some suggestion where you should definitely talk to Juan Murdoch as well as many other people and, and get, get their opinions also. Yeah, I mean, my, my, my suggestion there is um, yeah, every funder has different goals, right? And more and more, there are, there are investors who are focused on, on increasing representation of, of minority and, and women founders in their portfolio. So definitely that's, that's where you'll have a great chance. And if you know that, if you read on their website or someone tells you they're focused on this, absolutely be direct about it. But there are many, many funds who obviously they raise money from institutions and their, their primary focus is getting a, a really high return for them. That's, that's their job. That's what they're paid for. It's in their mandate. It's, it's kind of their fiduciary duty. So if you're pitching to those people who may not necessarily have a, a mandate, um, of increasing diversity in their portfolio, which they should. I mean, everybody should, because it's kind of scientifically proven it, it'll increase your returns. But if they don't have that, um, one thing to remember is they're they're listening to all the pitches from the same kinds of people. So they're used to hearing a certain kind of pitch. You wanna you want that to be kind of your base and then differentiate yourself above that. If you come off too different, then they're gonna be then it's just, it's what we're saying how uh, people are afraid of what's different. But if you come off kind of with this base of this is exactly like from a, a good founder I've heard from, and now he's even better um, because he's got this extra piece in his background or this extra thesis he's pursuing, um, then, you know, they'll, they'll look at you like a, you know, a, a star founder. So I think just, it's just important to understand who you're pitching to and what their goals are. And hopefully, you know, people's goals will start to align to more diversity in the industry. Yeah. Um, Murdoch? Yeah. You know, you asked a question earlier about, you know, is, is the pathway harder? And, and as Prof will said, absolutely. But once you can get to a certain point, there are actually lots of people who want to give you bonus points um, because, because you're female or from an underrepresented group. And again, I, you know, I don't think it's necessarily charitable. They, they recognize that that offers value not just for society but there's there's a better chance of success they look at the statistics and they and they see how female found, founders perform um so like you know profil and i we're, we're in rocky's venture club to, together and and they prioritize um female founders uh and founders from underrepresented groups and i think there's a lot of groups like that and increasingly um because they both recognize it's good for society but also good for the bottom line um, so if you can get to that point and you can find the right groups per, per the comment earlier, um, I think, I think there's an uh, there's actually additional opportunity. And then per, per, um, Profil's comment about talking to lots of people to get, to get that guidance. Um, yeah, I find I investors, it, it, they're kind of like doctors, like you get a bunch of different opinions. And so you just have to, well, it's hard to do this with doctors, but, you know, talk to enough to see what, you know, what common uh, themes shine through, kind of like when you're doing customer discovery uh, for your venture, um, you know, one customer is not adequate, but when you talk to 100, you start to, you start to see some, some general repeated themes. And so certainly do the, the same with advisors, see what consistencies you get. Thank you. Um, and so the, my next question takes us to um, something that a few of you have hit on around, you know, and one, you, you most recently mentioned, you know, the investors are getting a lot of the same pitch from a lot of the same, the same people. Um, and, you know, for, for internalized specifically, we, 
are going after a market that is is maybe a little bit untapped or maybe even unfamiliar with with you know most investors. Um, I'm I'm pretty you know I try to follow as many investors on Twitter and you know they they come from a lot of the same backgrounds. If you know Ivy League uh, degrees, um, you know they're in Silicon Valley and they're kind of in this bubble where you know I'm I'm a founder and I I solved. Uh, a problem that was near and dear to my heart and that, you know, I actively see and, and grew up with. Um, and, and that picture might be a little bit hard to paint um, in an investor's mind. And so, um, to, you know, do, do any of you have any feedback around, you know, how we can effectively communicate market opportunities that maybe investors aren't necessarily familiar with? And, you know, follow the dollars is kind of the, the, you know, a, a big theme, right? I mean, a big part of any investment thesis in early stage companies, the, the addressable market, and you have to be able to explain it very clearly. Um, and, and most investors, I would say, are, are skeptics, right? So to the extent you can prove this addressable market is accessible and there are a ton of dollars here and this is good product market fit, um, you know, that, that, that is kind of the core of, of any thesis, right? A big TAM and good product market fit. Um, so very specific examples, if, if, if it's, if it's already working even better. Um, so when there's, you know, some revenue there, you know, and you can show it's repeatable, it's recurring, um, that helps a ton. I mean, the numbers typically don't lie. Right. So other than that, I mean, yeah, pe people are just afraid of what's different. That seems to be the common, the common theme, you know, what they don't recognize. Also, in addition to that is the impact aspect. Uh, if you can just clarify what the problem is, the, for example, the problem is that, uh, uh, just making up an example where minority students don't go to college, you know, why do they not go to college? What's the, what's the, problems from them not going to college, what are the societal needs? There are several impact investors who will actually want to just focus on helping that out. There's also family offices that would, that would uh, help you out and definitely foundations that wants to just see the impact. So if you can't come up with all the dollar figure, see if you can come up with some social impact. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So my uh, the next question, um, and and you know this will really be for um, founders like myself who you know maybe are first gen or are definitely from low income backgrounds. But um, outside of a, a friends and family round, which um, you know unfortunately for me just out of the picture, right? I, I don't really have anybody that I, I can you know lean on, and um, even when I heard about that people do that, it kind of blew my mind. Um, so so that's definitely out of the picture for me, but. Um, like, what would you recommend for, for getting funded, uh, you know, maybe for a social impact company between uh, the, the awards and, and competitions or, you know, Prafu, you mentioned, um, you know, angel investors or family offices, uh, you know, and of course, besides building, and I, and I think we can all agree that the best form of funding is, is you know, revenue from customers. Um, but in order to scale, maybe, you know, what would those steps be for, for someone that can't have access to friends and family money? Well, I'm going to have Monica talk about the con contest and prizes, but uh, briefly for me, uh, I'm on the board of director for Social Venture Circle, where we actually focus on helping out startup companies, which is only for social impact, much more than worried about ROI. So that's one place you can definitely apply. And Monica can tell you more about all the X Prize and the connections he has. Yeah, definitely. It is a bit of a different um, route to go, but it's great because it's something that can be done in conjunction with what you're already doing. Um, and it's a really great way to almost um, test the water. You get opportunities to have whatever um, you know product or service or technology you're building to be field tested, um, depending on the competition. It could be global, it could be US-based, but it's great no matter where you are, you should be able to compete and be able to have a field test built in to be able to get some data and extrapolate how your actual product or service performs. And it's 
a way in which you don't have to pay for that field test and that data where you're already working with someone who's doing it as far as a competition and you can use that to bolster your portfolio and the information you have when you go out and you pitch as well. So there's a lot of benefits to being able to compete in some of these incentivized challenges. And there's a couple that I put in there. Um, I know that um, Backstage Capital as well as Harlem Capital are two VC firms that are specifically always looking for diverse entrepreneurs as well as everyone right now think about the future of work and you know the effects of COVID-19 on our frontline workers and those who are working, you know, your usual cashier, very forward human facing jobs, Microsoft and Deloitte have challenges as well as the future of work challenge that's um, led by New Profit, which is how you get X-Price rapid reskilling and the MIT Solve Challenge. Um, it's very beneficial to do that because once again, like I said, there's a low entry um, barrier to entry. Most times are at least at X-Price, there's um, opportunities to compete for free. And all you have to do is, you know, show up with your team yourself as an individual. It doesn't necessarily be like a big organization of people competing. Um, historically, we've had some great success in small teams, families, you know, a guy and his wife, or, you know, a guy and his brother, a woman and, you know, her sister to come in with an idea. They kind of started tinkering around, but now they have the motivation to see it go far and a little bit of that support system to be able to get the things they need to be able to get off the ground and be able to get some funds going while also competing and really being able to do it in an accelerated time line because our prizes only last at the maximum four or five years and recently we've been launching prizes and challenges that are very short you know from three to four months to two years which is usually short for the historical way in which x prize does our prizes so it's a really great opportunity to be able to you know add another option to your vcs your angel investors as well as some incentivized competitions and challenges that allows you to be able to compete but also win money at the same time while accelerating your timeline in which you're actually moving things forward for your business. Uh, I'd also um, add that, uh, oh, go ahead, Prof. I just gonna add one more that, for example, when I look at the several biotech or yeah, medical device type companies, uh, I try look at the, how many grants or state government funding they got just so that we'll have a feeling that, okay, someone else has looked at this particular project and it, it, they think it's worthwhile to give them a grant. And the same thing applies with the X prize. If, some, if you got the X prize money or something, it's, oh, this is an interesting project, worthwhile funding. And, and you know, a lot of um, big foundations and nonprofits, you know, they've, they've historically done a lot of, you know, philanthropy. Um, but they're, they're doing things now called uh, MRIs, mission-related investment, and PRIs, right, program-related investment. And they're typically kind of just these two different pools of capital. And the MRI capital is going towards the impact funds, right, um, that are focused on this type of audience, looking for market rate returns and high impact. But there's also this um, other PRI money. So when you're speaking to impact funds, you know, you may hit impact and, and, and maybe they are seeing that it's too early for them. Um, you could ask if... if some of their limited partners might have a pool of capital that that would be good for your stage. Um, we, f we find that a lot when we're speaking to early stage companies, they're not necessarily at, at the stage where we'd invest, um, but some of our partners uh, have pools of capital that invest in that early stage. It's more you know longer term capital, um, non-dilutive. Uh, so so just again, it's like the intro thing. You would speak to one person, see if they if one of their partners in their ecosystem. Uh, can also be a, a, a positive conversation for you. I want to raise one other thing really quickly that um, when Praful is talking about the state grants, there are also things like um, um, applying for something through like National Science Foundation or National Institute of Health. And sometimes uh, they'll provide, you know, some seed money for a concept that can then be hatched out to become a business as well. So I think that government piece is a, is a key piece, and I know that that's not something people always think of when they're when they're when they're putting this together. And so, say you know the we have we you know we have a founder who is is building a company and you know is thinking about fundraising. When is it appropriate for that founder to start reaching out to investors? Um, you know, should they do it, you know, as they're building and trying to prove the concept? Should they do it maybe once they have revenue or, you know, when, when is that appropriate time to, to make that outreach and start building those relationships? Sure. Um, so 
I would say there's really two questions there. The question of when you take money and the question of when you start connecting. Um, for the question of when you start connecting as early as possible. Um, you know, uh, again, to use the, the Rockies Venture Club example that Profil and I are a part of, um, we love getting to know entrepreneurs way before they're raising money. We love for them to be part of our accelerators. We love to uh, attend our events. We love to just have that relationship and know them so that by the time they're raising money, even if it's two, three years later, then we, then we know these guys inside and out. We, you know, we know like there's been some uh, discussion during this panel about, you know, knowing their personality and knowing how well they're able to pivot. And some of the things I mentioned about, you know, their humility and, and so we love having a long-term relationship. And, and so in addition to providing value for the investor, what it provides value for the entrepreneur is to understand where, what they need to be at a point where uh, the investor would give them money, what milestones they need to achieve, you know, how far along they need to be. Um, for, the, for the other question of when you actually take the money, um, my general answer is as late as possible. Uh, because early money is expensive money. Um, when, you, when you're early, your valuation is a lot less because there's a lot more risk there. So you have to give away a lot more of your company to raise a certain amount of funds. So you, you, know, you lose that equity. I mean, you kind of think of raising equity as like taking a loan for a uh, you know, 40 to 60% annual rate, um, which is what the investor is expecting. That's really expensive. You want to put that off as long as possible. Um, but building the relationships um, as early as possible. Awesome. Thank you. And so I would imagine so that investor pitches are not exactly the five minute on stage demo days, maybe that uh, I've participated in before. Um, what what does an actual investor pitch look like? Are we sending the deck prior? Is it, are we, you know, walking the investor through it? Are we actually, you know, have a five minute pitch? Is it 30 minute pitch? Uh, you know, what, what does it actually look like to be in that room with an investor? Or when in a I, Zoom room? <laughs> when I gave the talk uh, at the entrepreneurship class at CU last year, I had a slide said 30 second, three minutes, 30 minutes. You get my attention in 30 seconds, I might be willing to spend three minutes with you. And if that's, then I'll spend half hour. That's, that's how I look at it. And part of the reasons uh, is, is to emphasize how important it is to get your message across fast. Secondly, uh, I, I'm an angel investor. I just have a small number of companies compared to these big VCs, which who gets typically hundreds of companies pitching them every week. So you got to think about that. Maybe Juan can answer or um, talk more about that. Yeah, I mean, we we schedule a ton of, of pitches for, for Mondays and we'll have them scattered out throughout the week as well. Um, like actual pitches, we'll receive emails. You know, like you said, it's, it's, it's hundreds, it's a lot of emails. I mean, it's through our website, through referrals, right? So people that are getting the intro and you know, they talk to one VC and then that VC is not a fit. So he emails us saying, Hey, I think I might have something for you. And then we schedule a call with them. Maybe, maybe not. Um, definitely always send the deck uh, beforehand. You want materials. Um, you know, I tell you in the beginning, it's, it's again, that engaging piece. Um, there is some merit to the, you know, people, I mean, we'll have different opinions to the, to the connecting at the beginning, the small talk. I mean, likability is a huge thing. Um, uh, it's just like this, this uh, uh, intangible factor, right? Where if you're like really likable in the beginning and you engage in a conversation, uh, it's more likely they're willing to listen to the rest of the thing you have to say, which is about your company. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, we get a lot of pitches with a lot of um, high uh, expectations, you know, where we're gonna grow this much, this much, this much, and that's, this is how it's gonna be. Um, I think, you know, like I mentioned before, most investors can be skeptics. So uh, if you can back those up, great. Um, but always having, trying to have more realistic or conservative, I think goes a, a longer way than saying this is going to be the next unicorn. Um, definitely, you know, you want to show them that it has the potential to be. Um, but projecting things out, I think you always kind of 
err on the side of uh, what can I realistically back up today? And, 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 and I think people appreciate that honesty. Um, and they'll say, look, this is, I mean, they'll look at it and say, this is something I can underwrite. Um, these are conservative. So there's good upside, right? It's all about the upside in, in equity investing. Um, and yeah, just keeping people's attention is, is tough, you know? So um, running through your deck without spending too much time on a certain piece is great. Like having that really concise story as, as Prof was mentioning, just, a, you know, what's, what's, what's your company do, you know, how to make money, what mission is it solving? Um, and what's in it for the investor? Why should the investor invest in you versus all the other opportunities they have at their hands, right? Um, and yeah, I feel like I had one more point, but I lost my train of thought. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of what, it, what I'd say it, it looks like. Okay, gotcha. And, and one point that you brought up was, you know, hundreds of, of inbound pitches a, a week, right? Which for a, a founder like me, I, I might get, you know, some imposter syndrome or, you know, something where I'm like, okay, maybe I don't want to reach out or, and, and if I do, um, it's going to be cold. Um, what is the thought process around, you know, I know some investors are only warm intros that they take. Others are trying to knock that barrier down and say, everybody, you know, accept cold outreach. Um, but maybe for, for founders while, you know, still living in a warm intro needed world of, of, you know, venture capital, what is that best step for someone that doesn't have many connections to get a warm intro to, to an investor? Um, you know, yeah, try to uh, LinkedIn, you know, I'm thinking like what I do, like, you know, we, as a fund, we fundraise also, right. We have to raise money for our fund to then uh, invest in companies. And when I'm looking at a, a new institution that might, uh, have a pool of capital and I don't know anybody there, I'll look at my LinkedIn and see if somebody's connected to them and I'll ask them, Hey, can you provide an intro there? Um, you know, it, it helps that, you know, we, we have a fund and we have a, a, a track record. Um, it's, it's harder when you don't have, you know, uh, a, a track record behind you. Um, but I'd say, you know, cold can, can work, especially, you know, being very persistent. Um, I've had plenty of examples where, you know, I followed up maybe, you know, seven, 10, 15 times. And at some point they respond, um, you know, if they say, don't bother me, then don't bother them. But if they're not responding, just, I would say continue like in, investors, a lot of the philosophies deal flow is everything. So they like to say, we look at every deal and that's why we can pick the best ones because we're able to look at all of them. And we, you know, we're not, we won't have the problem of adverse selection where we only get a few and we have to do those few. So um, if there's a compelling email or a compelling story um, at the minimum, you know, I, I try to respond to most of the inbounds, but you know, some of them fall through the cracks and those who, re who reply, you know, three or four times eventually, you know, I'm like, Oh, I, I missed this one. And I'll, I'll look through and maybe it'll be a call. Maybe, maybe there won't be, uh, but persistence is, is super key. I think it's a bit different here in Boulder, Denver area, because it's a community, which is highly collaborative and people know each other. It's, uh, I think most people know enough other people involved in the social impact space, uh, organizations, uh, even college professors, they know enough investors and investor connections. So you should not have any trouble finding anybody in the Boulder, Denver vicinity. Uh, it, of course, it, it's, it's very, very different when you get to the big city like New York, you know, or, or San Francisco, Boston area. Here, it's really simple. You should be able to find a connection to Rockies Venture Club or Social Venture Circle really easy. Love it. Love the the community that here in uh, here in Colorado that we foster for entrepreneurship. Um, I do want to leave some time for the the Q and A if we want to. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, oh, the first question is me. What type of projects do you like to invest in? Uh, I like to invest in projects that don't lose all my money. Uh, <laughs> let's see. And with social ventures, how do you gauge your ROI? Now, on a serious note, uh, as an investor, uh, uh, I know most companies will fail, especially if it's focused on social impact. So my way of looking at 
social impact ROI is how badly do I feel when I lose money? You know, I'm going to lose money. So you know what? This was helping out the world. Uh, it's fine. It's a totally different perspective than when you talk to uh, our VCs and and uh, they have. Let me just get back to. Oops. Different world. Uh, what was the second question? There was another question. It looks like. Okay, the second question was regarding. It's it's gone now. Uh, minorities and and uh, women. How come they don't get? They have trouble getting funding, and I think we kind of addressed on it. But if uh, anyone wants to elaborate more, that's go ahead. <laughs> Juan, you wanna? Um, I mean, I th I think there is a uh, there is definitely you know science backing that there's implicit bias. Uh, you know, if you guys have seen Darren Dotson and Stanford's work, um, where they've done the studies, you know, showing the same exact fund, but one's an African American founder, one's a white founder. There's there's implicit bias. Um, so to a certain extent, it's you know maybe it's 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 unconscious for some people, um, and and we have to push through that, right? And Darren's doing great work investing only in funds that are specifically focused on investing in in diverse entrepreneurs, um, and he's he's you know he's putting institutional capital into that space. Um, you know, I would say we've seen, you know, we see a, a big mix of founders and maybe it's because we've made it very known that we want diversity in our portfolio. So, you know, when, uh, when, a, like I said, like another VC finds that this company is not a fit for them, you know, they might email us saying good thesis, not a fit for us. Oh, plus it's a woman founder or plus it's a minority founder. So, you know, even, even more likely we'll take a look at it. Um, but then again, our portfolio is only 30% women and minorities. So I'm, you know, you know, I'd like to think we're, we're, you know, we keep everybody on, on, you know, a similar criteria. Do you got to be honest with us and ask, do we have implicit bias? Maybe we do. I don't, I don't know. We, you know, we, we got to take a step back and look through really, you know, what our actions have, you know, uh, led to in, in a portfolio. Um, I think, you know, at this year we did, you know, and, and try to, be very honest with ourselves. Do we, uh, you know, hold a woman to higher standards? I think there's studies showing that people tend to do that. Um, or, you know, if, uh, if, if people think a, a woman's very assertive, sometimes they mistake that for aggression, which is, is, uh, you know, not good. Um, you know, I think the female CEOs in our portfolio are, are really, really good. Um, so, it's, it's, it's a lot of people just taking a step back and, and being honest with, you know, how they're evaluating. Um, and then, and then people like Darren and, and other, the other impact funds, just being very intentional about investing in diverse entrepreneurs. Um, but again, it, it comes back to goals as well. I mean, we, uh, I don't think any fund will only, in, I mean, some will, but most funds won't only invest in a, in a company because it's a diverse founder. I mean, it has to be a, a good company as well. It's going to grow. It's going to make money. Um, just like you wouldn't invest only in a company because it's a, uh, actually, I, I guess some funds do because they're, you know, their friend's grandson or something. I guess there's, that does happen. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 I think we're moving uh, in the right direction just very slowly. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add to that. Right. Uh, it takes, you know, sadly, it takes years and years, and generations to actually get over the biases. Uh, one of I remember earlier, whenever I see a woman pitching, the type of questions that were being asked of her was all about, well, what about this thing can go wrong? This thing can go wrong. It's always about, you know, what can go wrong versus a question asked to a man was, hey, how much f more you can do? It's all about potential. They were only asking questions about how big can you go? Can be a unicorn or not? And it was, it was a minor little things that I've noticed over the years. And, and I, I help out most mainly women founder company because I know how much struggle they have trying to get started. I'd love to um, add a little to that. I think what we see is especially here in the US that white men get to fail up. Women and people of color, oftentimes it feels like you only have one chance and you can't blow it. And that's something that, you, as we see, bias plays into it, and it's not fair because it can be, like you said, exactly the same type of portfolio, same information. But it will be 
perceive differently. I think that's the opportunity to allow people to try. You know, we always like, oh, Steve Jobs did this, and he, you know, had skin as his teeth, and eight of his companies went down. But by golly, Apple, you know, he had the opportunity because of the privilege he has as a white man in the United States to be able to fail, but for people to still see the potential and to continue to give him money and to continue to pump into the idea and the potential that he has. And we find that women and people of color don't get the same opportunity as Prof said, These people to see the potential and continue to support because they believe in the potential and the future of the entrepreneur and the business. Yeah, thank you. Uh... For, for answering the the, the Q and A questions, um, we have a few minutes left. I know we you know wanted to wrap up and definitely respect all of our panelists' time. Um, for me, I just want to say thank you to to all of our panelists and to Carol for setting this up. Um, like a lot of our participants, um, I hope I have learned so much, um, and you know I'm, I'm excited to you know go back to the drawing board and you know use this new refined approach to going after investment. Um, and, and really using my story to, to my advantage. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very excited that I was able to tap into each of you today. So um, thank you all so much. Best of thank luck, David. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. And Praful, thanks for organizing everybody. And Juan, so great to meet you. Murdoch is on our board, so we're delighted that he could join us. And Monica, we met a few years ago, and um, I've been involved in doing some of the X Prize judging, and it's a great organization. So thank you for all your wisdom. If there's anything else you all want to put in the chat, other um, organizations that students can can know about, other funders for, for this population, um, we're going to make sure that um, we have that as part of the recorded session. So thanks to all of you, and uh, thanks to all of you who joined us today, and we'll send you the link, and we'll be sure to also um, feature it the next couple of days in our newsletter and uh, share that out widely. So thank you so much for your, your insight, and we look forward to really, um, beyond just raising these issues today, we look forward to really coalescing the right people who can really tackle um, these issues to move the bigger levers and get more um, women and people of color underrepresented populations to be successful in the entrepreneurship pipeline. So we look forward to achieving that with you beyond starting this conversation here today. Thanks again to David and we are so um, proud of you for stepping in and just um, taking the reins to organize all this and also to be a college student who's who's started a business. It's quite, I, I started a business when I was 35 and I can't even imagine tackling that in college. So um, hats off to you, David, and um, all of our first gen students who have just incredible skills and abilities, whether it's entrepreneurship or running a big company or whatever it is that um, can really take our, our nation and our world forward. So thanks to all of you and we'll see you the next time. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a great Bye -bye. day. Thanks, Carol. Bye, everyone. Take care. We'll stay a couple minutes in case there's anything else people want to post up there. <laughs>